Live from New York City, it's The Gary Knoll Show. And now, your host, Gary Knoll. Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Knoll, broadcasting and video streaming live from our studios in New York City. And sometimes, because of how Facebook's work, so you won't get a live feed, but if you can't get it live by going to Pro- Progressive Radio Network uh, Facebook, you can watch it later today. Today we're going to not have a guest. I'm going to give you the latest on at least 20 different important understandings of health issues. Then on environmental issues. And tomorrow you won't want to miss it because I'm having one of the three leading climate change experts in the world on this program. He is honest. He is unflinching. He's like the Ralph Nader on this topic, and he was ridiculed and condemned because he spoke out, Professor Guy McPherson. He'll be live in studio. I'm filming him as part of this new major film. In fact, I believe it will be the most comprehensive film ever produced on the world, the planet, and our survival. And uh, we've been on it for a long time, and uh, hopefully I'll have it completed in the next six months so people can have a chance to see how bad things really are and why we haven't been told this. In any case, that's tomorrow, but I'll give you some of the latest updates today. Then I was watching something that's very popular now on the Internet, a physician talking about how foolish, irresponsible people are to challenge the safety and efficacy of vaccines. Of course vaccines work. They got rid of the smallpox epidemic and the measles epidemic. And people are not dying of measles anymore because of, well, the vaccine. No, he's wrong. And we'll prove it. We'll prove today information for those pro-vaccine people who are basing everything upon ideology and talking points and propaganda, but not actual science. The science is not on their side. The science is on the side of people who question the safety and efficacy of vaccines. Also, today, we didn't have a chance yesterday, but today I intend to just give a shout-out to how wonderful so many school teachers are for how they take that extra step to help the students in their classrooms. And also today, I was just thinking last night while I was writing a commentary today I'm going to share on Governor Cuomo making a statement and then doubling down on it that America was never great. Now, the far left politically, and possibly the far right politically, will will rally around that. And then that becomes a big hoo-ha-ha. But it's an embarrassment that an individual with his academic background, his position of public authority, former attorney general, the governor, would dismiss how great America has been and is today. That is not to say that we have not been stupid on multiple occasions. I'll lay those out as well. But I feel privileged and blessed to be able to live in such a remarkably wonderful country. And for those who only want to see the worst in people, the worst in events, that's unfortunate. But you're not the majority. For those that show up at demonstrations, like that professor from California, and and bashed five people in the head with a bike chain and then tried to hide, that that's not a part of our country, our heritage, of doing something like that. If you have an issue, there are appropriate ways of protesting that issue. Lots of good ways, and we have historically done that. So I'm going to talk about this, and then open it up for your calls. You'll have a chance to call in and share your points of view. We always begin with the latest on health and healing. There is a program on television about, I think it's called Man Fire Food. And uh, it's, again, it's a popular program. People like it because it shows how you can cook, generally in these barbecue pits, for 10, 12, 14 hours uh, a side of beef or whatever you're cooking, and then how everyone gorges down on it, the huge portions. And that's a part of certain areas' culture. That's what they expect. It's unhealthy. In the very places where people are eating these kind of foods, such as in Louisiana, Mississippi, West Virginia, Alabama, Georgia, you have 
the most obesity and the most disease of any states in the United States. So here's what you should know if you're still thinking that barbecuing is a good thing, that charcoal cooking is a good thing, that wood is a good thing in cooking, and coal, it's not. According to University of Oxford, in a new study just this week, long-term use of coal or wood or charcoal for cooking is associated with an increase in the risk of death from cardiovascular disease. That's according to a study presented just today. And, uh, and quote, our studies suggest that people who use solid fuels for cooking should switch to gas or electric as possible. And it's been suggested that air pollution from cooking with solid fuels like coal or wood or charcoal can lead to premature death from cardiovascular disease. And so don't be thinking that somehow you're doing something cool when you're cooking with wood or coal or these other charcoals. You're not. There's a natural way to lower your blood pressure. There are many ways. Eating garlic every day. In fact, you've heard me say that uh, garlic and onion a day keeps a stroke away. Both thin the blood and protect your heart. Well, drinking hibiscus, H-I-B-I-S-S, C-U-S, T, according to the University of Nigeria, will do the trick. Now, high blood pressure is also called hypertension, and it's a progressive condition that can lead to many life-threatening uh, events like heart attack. And sadly, Western medicine believes that toxic medication like statins are the only answer. They are not. But in truth, there are many ways to naturally lower blood pressure, um, like hibiscus tea each day. That'll make a difference. And if you put some vitamin C and vitamin E and quercetin in there, all the best. And this was published in the Indian Journal of Pharmacology, and it showed that it lowers uh, the blood pressure, and that can save a life. Writing a thank you note is more powerful than we realized. According to a study from the University of Texas, new research proves that writing letters of gratitude is a pro-social experience people should commit often. The gesture improves well-being for not only the letter writer, but recipients as well. This was published in Psychological Science, a research conducted at, in the Macomb School of Business, University of, uh, of Texas, showed that this is the case, that a letter of gratitude to someone who's done something nice for them, and then anticipate the recipient's reaction. Quote, we saw that it is not only good in, in just a matter of minutes that it takes to write a letter, but you feel better about it. And people receiving it, of course, are going to feel better as well. Now consider that up against what people generally write on social media. Narcissistic, self-interested, self-absorbed topics about what you ate for breakfast today as if that's relevant to other people. Or look at a picture of me brushing my teeth. It has become supercilious, and yet it's done all the time. Every second, every millisecond, someone's taking a stupid picture of themselves and sharing it, as if these friends are real friends. They're not, as if the world cares. Nobody cares, and as if somehow this is going to ingratiate you and show that you have relevance. You have no relevance unless you create relevance, and relevance isn't created through uh, examining and exposing every corpuscle of our being to the world, as if the more we confess about our flaws and, and fortunes, that enables other people to better respect us. It does not. It's just a waste of life. But sitting down, as I recommend all the people that I counsel do, this is one of the things I never talk about, but it's very important, and even the people coming to the upcoming retreat, this is one of the things they'll be asked to do. Write a letter based upon how you've responded to people and what you've gotten away with that no one realized you got away with. Meaning you lied about something, or you cheated, or you stole, or whatever you did, you betrayed. Now, write a letter to the people that you did this to. Now, they may be dead, maybe someone from the past, maybe someone you don't even know where they're at. But it's important that you write it because you're, you're learning a lesson about Honoring the karma 
that you've created, the fact that we've gotten away with something, doesn't mean that we've gotten away with anything, especially with the construct that what if everything in life has a silent witness? And therefore, think before you say something. Think before you do something. Always ask yourself, if what I'm about to say and what I'm about to do, can I live with this? Can I be feel good about this? If anyone knew this about me, would they still feel I'm okay? And it's that part of ourselves that we deny, that we deplore, that we hide from and frequently overreact to other people. You see this all the time. In fact, last evening, um, we were interviewing people from Wikipedia. Lots of people were being inundated by people. In fact, right now, as I'm speaking in our other room, we have George Galloway speaking with us about his personal experiences. And, uh, and we have new information from Cheryl Atkinson. All these people. Why? Because nobody thought before they denigrated them, libeled them, slandered them, without any recourse, none, that maybe it was wrong. And we're finding this is our personal experience that this is more like a cult a cult of people who aren't fitting in in the real world. So what happens, and this goes for anything and everything, what happens in the real world you don't feel like you belong or you don't fit or you're not able to to harmonize with people, what's the likelihood you're going to act that out in a negative way? How many people go into armed forces? How many people become members of SWAT teams and hormone up? and feel really good, almost erotic, when they put on that all that armor, knowing that they can kill people, beat people, break down doors, yell, scream, kill a dog. Do you think that's normal? Do you think it's normal to be a police officer and bust people up, including a woman that was chained to her cell, and then go in and beat her until you broke your jaw? What kind of man does that? Not a man does that. No. Someone who dishonors life does that. Well, why are there so damn many in all fields? And what if you're not a police officer? And by the way, that's not a condemnation of all police officers because the vast majority are not going to act out. We only find out about the ones who do. And then, unfortunately, that's like a cop walking in front of a a projector in a drive-in theater. They're only six foot tall, but when you walk in front of that light, you're projected to 60 feet tall on the screen. And we forget about the decent ones in all professions, the decent doctors, the decent nurses, the decent uh, emergency workers, the decent social workers, the decent police officers, decent people in the military who will not cross a boundary, will not touch the third rail of being abusive to other people because they have the power and are indemnified for doing so. And thank goodness we're aware of that. But what about the people who use these positions of power against others? So part of what I do, part of what works, is getting people to acknowledge what they've done, to be honest about it, and then seek forgiveness. Now, it's not necessarily the person that you've hurt you're going to get forgiveness from. More often than not, you won't. People might forget about what you did, but they're not going to forgive you more often than not. Your parents and siblings, best friends will because there's a level of tolerance that they're willing to accept beyond which any normal person would. If, if, a, if a regular person, here's the standard. Let's be very clear about this. Please, please listen to what I'm saying. If you feel it's reasonable, use it. If not, discard it. I would never expect that I could speak to someone who's in my life in any other way than I would speak with a stranger. I would never feel comfortable denigrating, ridiculing, belittling, or threatening someone because I'm familiar with them than I would with a stranger who'd tell me immediately to back off or throw a swing at me. Why is it that we feel the people are close to us, the people who've trusted us, the people that are in our lives, the people who have been essential to us, we feel that somehow we have a right 
to say things that we to them that we would never say to a stranger. And that suddenly makes the the connection, the energy connection, it breaks it, snaps it. Now you may stay together, you may stay friends, but trust is never going to be a part of that future. Once you no longer have trust in anything you do, you're no longer authentically connected to it. Then you're just going through formalized rituals with no substance. Want to get a good idea of that? Look at the Catholic Church today. Look at the Pope today, a man who you've only heard me speak highly of, and uh, because I saw within him and his actions and his statements a man of integrity. Now I'm questioning that. Now the previous Pope should never have been a Pope, Cardinal Rassinger. And uh, why? Because he oversaw all the pedophilia scandals, hiding priests. The Vatican actually had a in effect, an underground railroad where they would take a priest who was in trouble and move them into an area where they couldn't be found, couldn't be located. They disappeared them all over the place, but more often than not in Italy because they're a sovereign state, they're a sovereign nation, the Vatican is. The smallest one in the world, but it's still there. And uh, so once they hide you, you stay hidden, and no extradition is going to get you out of there. They did this for decades, decades. They're the ones who got all the money that trickled down from the laundries in Ireland. Now the Irish people knew when they were taking their laundry there that those were Irish young women who would spend their entire life in a form of captivity. Shame on the people that took your laundry to one of these places, and shame on the Catholic Church and all the popes that benefited from it. But what if you believe, and rightly so in many of the tenets, that you grew up with about morality and and ethics, and you want to keep that. Can you keep that and at the same time be hypercritical of the corruption, the misogyny, the lack of respect for women? If we had respect for women long ago, you would have seen women priests. And nothing that's being done is based upon the actual original writings. You want to get into that discussion? I'll be happy to because that's I know more about that than I do about nutrition. I just don't talk about it. It's one of my passions. It's all stupid. So I believe that today, because of this crisis of covering up for some of the uh, bishops and cardinals, that there should be self-examination and there should be critical analysis and without someone having the opportunity to hide behind their religious position and authority. I believe that all authority figures in all religions, in all political systems, in all social systems should be held to the same standards as the average person. There shouldn't be two systems of judging someone. There should be one. There should be one system where we think before we judge someone what is it like to be on the other side and how better, more constructively, can we create a dialogue with our anger, our resentment, our disappointment to see things that change in a more remarkable way. Just some thoughts. That's why those letters are so important. And I spent about a three-hour lecture just on the topic of what the letter represents at an energy level. Forget anything else. Forget a psychological level. I'm talking about an energy level to start to heal things you've done in the past and understand the power of deception. Remember, Think on this. No one ever does anything bad unless there's a big benefit to it. Including, by the way, many of the things we have done with ourselves with disease. Hard to imagine. Now, they are diseases that have nothing to do with free will. Circumstances, yes. But what about those disease states where we gain something from our disease and therefore identify with that gain instead of what it means to be free of a disease and therefore free to make better choices. Again, I'm just throwing out some topics that you could write about in your letter of forgiveness because you've got to forgive yourself for what you've done to other people. So they, And then if they're not around, read the letter, honor the energy, and then burn it. From, I'd like some feedback if people have done that, how it's worked for them. That's also part of the, many of the sacred ceremonies of the uh, sweat lodges. From Green Med Info, that topical black seed oil you've heard me talk about, 
that's good for everything. It beats Tylenol for pain relief and osteoarthritis. Now, considering how many people have osteoarthritis, that's a big deal. So that tiny black seed strikes again. Even orally administered Tylenol can't compete with the topical application for all your outside injuries where you have pain and swelling. It has enormous capacity to reduce swelling and turn off pain. Quote, this study showed the topical use of nigella, that's uh, sativa oil, that's your black seed oil, can be more effective in reducing knee pain in elderly patients than uh, Tylenol, which is typically used as, as a safe supplement for elderly. I don't believe it's safe, but black seed oil is. And finally, beetroot, that comes from the beet, has blood pressure benefits for pregnant women. This is according to the University of Manchester, which is in the United Kingdom, and as well as the Karolinsk Institute, which is in Sweden. So if you have high blood pressure, try having a glass of beet juice or eating some beets. It can make a big difference, especially if you're uh, pregnant. That's the latest on health and healing, broadcasting and video streaming live from my studio in New York City. I'm Gary Nall. We're going to take a brief break and come right back. Please stay with us. Just a couple of program announcements, then we're going to go to um, Richard Gale, who has a commentary based upon all this uh, enormous adulation for uh, a senator from Arizona, uh, who a lot of just died, uh, John McCain, and it seems like no one in the media is willing to take an honest look at this man, and he will, both the positive and negative. Put this in proper perspective. Um, in just a moment, I'm going to give my, my feedback to Governor Cuomo and those who believe that America is a bad place with only bad people, racist, rednecks, uh, uh, regressives, uh, deplorables, uh, and that all rich people are bad and you should not own anything. And, and well, I have a few words in response. But... Now we immediately filled up, and uh, for the this coming Saturday, it's a mini little little tiny fun ride, but something fun for WBAI, where you write a check out for twenty five dollars made out to WBAI, and I give it to them. But in return, we can spend some time having a nice you know meal. You pay for your own meal at a nice vegetarian restaurant. And then it was either go to a play or go to a movie or socialize, like walk down to Lincoln Center. Everybody wants socialize. Nobody won the meter, the the play. So we're skipping the play and skipping the movie, and it'll be Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Saturday's packed. And so if you want to come and have a meal and socialize with other people, uh, maybe as many as 15, um, that, that would be max then give a call at 646-926-5422 or go to prnstudio at gmail.com. That'll be fun. And the station makes a little money. That money will pay someone's salary, a couple people's salary, for next week. It's what we do to try to help the station. Also, um, I have a dance for everyone, including any of the other, excuse me, programs on WBAI. It's a free. I, I pay for it. And it's at a nice nightclub, and uh, and it's interesting to go out dancing where there's no no booze and no drugs and no smoking, just having a great time socializing. All ages. In fact, some of the older people, uh, I have people in their 90s come and want to dance, and for other people from teens on, um, come single couple families have a good time, and uh, just give a call to six four six. 
926-5422 or uh, and just say dance party and you'll be called back at and also prnstudio at gmail.com and finally uh, we have uh, we have raised enough money to pay for about 500 and counting premiums from this last fund drive that was not unfortunately successful and we're doing another one the first week of October full, sorry, and the second week we only have three places left. If you'd like to join me and a wonderful group of people, just give a call. You'll be calling Luann. I don't have her number in front of me. We'll get her number so you can call her. And, and uh, if you've never been to a retreat, and everyone's different. I, I, I do all brand, I'm, I'm doing a whole new lecture series. It's going to be so much fun. I've come up with a whole new construct of understanding human nature, brand new. In fact, I'm, I'm having my film crew come down. It's the last day of our uh, film shoot when we're on the road, and we're going to drive there from New Orleans where we're shooting in the Lower Ninth Ward. And then I'm going to set up so we can actually uh, film this because I'm. If, if you read the book I wrote about eight years ago called Living in the Moment, Prescription for the Souls, this will be the sequel to it. This takes you to a whole other level of understanding human nature. And every single night, I'll be doing a different lecture. And in the daytime, I do little mini lectures. Anyhow, uh, so that's one of the things that makes it fun. But understanding how to look at life differently, how to laugh a lot, because we laugh at everything all the time, and to learn and to be relaxed and de-stressed in a wonderful, beautiful environment with a great staff, the staff comes from all over the United States. And these are all professionals, doctors, lawyers, judges, architects, all kinds of people come in to help you. Now, they don't tell you what they do. And I ask them, don't tell people about your life or what you do. And, uh, but the, these, are, these are wonderful people meeting other people who are coming, for each for a different reason. So here's Luann's number if you'd like to come. 903 881-7008, 903-881-7008. And what I don't do, so you're very clear on this, I don't diagnose or treat any disease. I never have, I never will. Out of, I'm guessing, 72,000 people I've counseled in my career, I've never once talked about disease. If you came to see me with terminal cancer, the word cancer will never come up. It's kind of unusual because everyone starts with the disease and its symptoms, and I don't. I have a completely different way of manifesting wellness in people. And if you wonder, does it work? Well, how about this? How about taking seven people with terminal and ir medically irreversible conditions that nothing they had done in their medical treatment worked, and after a week to two weeks, they were able to go out one morning without knowing what they were going to do and take a walk that lasted 27 to 30 miles, and they left without their conditions, and today they still don't have those conditions according to their follow-up medical exams. I don't talk about what happens. I don't explain it. I never will explain it. Just accept it as a gift. A lot of wonderful things happen at a retreat. So I believe that uh, our, our Jesse, uh, you might have a clip just to hear from uh, one or two little responses from the last uh, retreat. This is just and by the way, uncoached, this is just after lunch when they're leaving to go back home. I ask them to go over the telephone and just tell people very briefly what they experienced. My name is Carol. I'm here at the retreat. I've had a really fantastic time. I was looking forward to it, didn't know what to expect, knew it sounded good, knew it was something that would be helpful to me. And I'm <laughs> so far, I think... Everyone, a lot of people here seem to be so much more ahead of me as far as knowing what to eat and how to eat. But I'm learning that right now, believe it or not, I'm, cu I'm cutting sprouts in the kitchen, which is, if anybody that knows me <laughs> heard that, they would think that it can't be me who's talking. But it's been it's it's been really great. I think I'm, I'm learning how to eat. Um how to prepare things. We're doing great exercise. I'm out six o'clock in the morning, power walking, which is just news to me, water aerobics, yoga. It's been just a total fantastic 
experience. And I, I hope to go back, use it for me. I hope to share it with my friends and family, if they'll let me. And I just feel very fortunate to be here, and I'm glad I came. And it's wonderful. The setting is fantastic, and the people are so nice, like-minded. And it's just it's, it's been great. My name's Glenn, and uh, I'm uh, I'm I'd say I'm more of an application type guy. I'm I'm always looking for what's practical and what's usable. Anyhow, I I, I got a lot here. Um, yeah, you know the the grounds are beautiful. Um, Everybody was super nice that was on the retreat, which is really important. It's kind of a good experience, but the most important thing, you know, there's there's the right way of living and doing stuff. It's, uh, you know, your, your life is an integrated whole. I mean, it is diet, which is crucial. Uh, it's attitude, which is so important. Um, Gary's lectures, and, you know, I always look for for stuff of substance, and I've, uh, I've found that. I found that with Gary. And, uh, of course, it's just a nice thing to have here and to have it as a working type thing where you can apply it. Uh, you know, there, there's so many, there's so many people, there's so many authors that they say a lot of words, but, you know, I'm always looking for the application portion and, and Gary and what's here is so rich and it's literally so wealthy in it sometimes and so often when you hear these things you'd like to to freeze frame stuff so you could just take it all in and digest it it's almost like uh, uh note taking is is just not enough uh i'm i'm definitely better for the experience uh, personally i think I'll, I'll be a better human being of course that's very general you know, I, I, I work, um, of course, to support my family. I've, I've got three kids, and uh, I think we're all going to benefit from it. I, I know I certainly have, and uh, I, have to, I have to thank Gary question. personally and all the staff for it. The most important question to ask is, why don't people more often than not believe that they deserve an opportunity to start over, to really rebalance, to rejuvenate, to regenerate? Why don't people believe that of all the priorities in their life, what they need as an essential human being should go to the top of the list? Everyone's got an excuse to resist doing something. But in life, we can either back out of life, saying no to everything, or we can say yes and go forward. So for those of you who want to say yes, give yourself an opportunity to grow, to expand, to cleanse, to detoxify, start over, harmonize in a beautiful environment with wonderful people. Call Luann, 903-881-7008, 903-881-7008. We have three spaces left, and hopefully we'll be able to buy another three to 400 premiums for the station. Now I have a commentary, then we're going to go to... Uh, Richard Gell is standing by. I can understand if a person lives their life as a politician or as a one of the acolytes of politicians, if they have no grounded sense of, of spiritual values or appreciation for what other people are doing since everything seems to be drawn back to their own egos, why they would think that supporting the negative view of life and the environment and the people of a country is beneficial. A lot of people thrive on negativity. They don't thrive in a good way. It's almost like a spastic energy, a hyperkinetic agitation. They can't feel good in their own skin. There has to be a constant sense of adulation towards them. They have to be the center of everything. But when I look at this country... I see hundreds of millions of souls that have done so much as individuals, as groups, to make this country unique. For example, uh, Governor Cuomo doesn't see that we've ever been good. You know, we've never been great. Well, I would take exception with that on many levels. First of all, our freedom of speech, something that is guaranteed in the First Amendment. Many countries of the world, historically, you have not had that freedom of speech unless you were close to those in power. But if you were the average person or in many of the other classes, no, that freedom of speech, if it went against the prevailing view, could put you in trouble, as it does today. But we've had a lot of opportunity in our, our society to say what's on our minds. 
the right of revolution. Remember, the signers of the Declaration of Independence were not unanimous. There were many people in the colonies and many of the representatives of those uh, colony people who were wanting to support the crown, didn't want to see us separate from Great Britain. But there was enough people who said that we must be free. And if that freedom requires us to fight, we will fight. So our ability to understand that one of our freedoms is that to rebel is important. Of course, reasonable people always want to see if there's not diplomacy uh, before you have to fight. Even if you have the ability to fight, one of the lessons of my martial arts uh, sensei was that if I teach you something in this room that can allow you to defend yourself, then only defend yourself, but never with the idea that you're going to inflict pain upon the other person. And everything must be measured to what it represents. So saving your life, yeah, defend yourself. Going out because you have the power to hurt another person, not a good use of that. So think of the ways that our founding fathers from then up till this time have made sacrifices. We're such a unique and great country that we actually were willing to fight each other during a civil war for the rights of others who had not been given those freedoms to have freedom and liberation. It was a hard-fought battle, lots of casualties, and some of that is still ruminating as of today. We also had, some might argue, the, the, the principle of federalism under Articles of Confederation, a, a partnering between the self-government and, um, and the commonwealth. Also, the suffragette movement, the status of women. Now, we were not the first. There were other countries, including Great Britain, that had, had suffragettes and those wanting freedoms. And the abolition of uh, slavery came long before, uh, in Great Britain, long before uh, it did in the United States. But we had ours. Shouldn't it be mandatory that every school kid today has a class in the abolitionists and the suffragettes and those people who sacrificed uh, privation and hardship and even death and imprisonment for the rights of other people. I think that's very important because if you don't have a history of how great you were and how individuals throughout this entire lifespan were, then you're not appreciating the country you live in today. Also, the freedom of worship uh, and whether you're an atheist and choose that, you have that right. I believe in the right of every person to believe in their religious faith. If you want to be Jewish or Islamic or Christian, those are your rights. And even if you're a Christian what, and a Protestant, which one are you? Lutheran? Presbyterian? Episcopalian? Baptist? These are your rights. In other countries today, in China, they don't have that right. And for 77 years in Russia, they didn't have that right. We do. That also makes a country great and its people great. Also, we have, we are a melting pot. We have our uniqueness of our cultures, but we also agree that we have to work together, and we have historically. That's part of our greatness. The concept of public schools, and although this could be accredited to the Napoleon uh, philosophy due to his advisor uh, who was uh, who was very famous in as a classical composer, Mendelssohn, we have to understand that we have public education. Now it's, a, it's in chaos today, but that's not because of the concept. It's because of the privatization and, and heavy loading in administrators instead of teachers, instead of putting the emphasis upon the student, and curriculums, and the school, and the teacher, were putting it into the politics of privatization and the charter schools, and and that's the wrong place to put it. We're also doing that at, at the college level as well. But we have had a lot of people gain a step up in life and have a better quality of life because they had that education. Also, aside from the Native Americans, we have uh, we have a deep spiritual tradition, notably the Transcendentalist, uh, the Emerson and Thoreau, and uh, Margaret Fuller, Walt Whitman, and uh, William 
William Henry, uh, Henry Channing and Emily Dickinson. Um, now, I say they are important because of their deep spiritual tradition. Now, the Native Americans had deep stir- spiritual traditions for thousands of years before anyone came. But that also is what was unique, is you could have an opportunity to have as deep a spiritual connection to life and to the people as you chose to. And it's from these people that some of the greatest works came in some of the direction that we're going in today is because of them. Think of Hemingway and Faulkner and Arthur Miller and Edgar Allan Poe and Tennessee Williams. And one of my favorites, if I consider the most important author uh, in American history, was Mark Twain. By the way, Mark Twain wasn't his real name. Mark is a Mark in uh, navigational terms. And Twain, we are at between two places where there's calm water and, and, uh, and strong water. But just go back and if you haven't read it, for goodness sakes, read uh, some of his important work. Uh, now, most people have read Tom Sawyer, but it was Huckleberry Finn that was one of the single most important books ever written, and it changed literature. Up until that po- point, most of the people who were writers were writing based upon what they had learned from classical or traditional um, stylists from England and France. Not, not Mark Twain. He wrote his words uh, for, uh, for this young, young boy, an illiterate, who he'd be called something like a rug rat today. He, he, was, uh, he was cast out, and yet here he was with this runaway slave on a bar, a little raft going down the Mississippi, not knowing what each day would uh, foretold, but he found friendship. But he was the first person to recognize his own prejudice, and he began to understand what it was to be this other person, And by the end of his trip, he had a point where he wrote a a note to the slaveholder to inform the slaveholder where the slave was. And instead, he decided that he would rather go to hell, in a literal sense, he believed it, than to betray this man because he saw him as a human being. Do you realize what that meant for all other authors who did not look at the African-American as a human being, but merely chattel, uh, commodity? Well, he brought a humanness. He brought the spiritual to that recognition. And originally, a lot of libraries refused to cover it uh, because they didn't like the raw, guttural language that Mark Twain used. Well, that book changed everyone after that. Quite simply, that has to be in the pantheon of of the of American literature, that's that's that in its own right is as important as the the Iliad was historically. Yet, how many young people today can say they've read it? How many millennials have read it, and what know its meaning, and how that can be used to show respect for other people, and not just objectify them through identity politics? So, when you look at Mark Twain, the original American badass. And he was a badass. And the others that came after him. And look at post-World War II. To avoid another depression, even the corporate mogul, Mongols or moguls engaged in building communities. And uh, there was a massive amount of philanthropy. Schools, libraries, towns, places of worship. A whole new infrastructure. Between 1945 and 1975, the middle class, the working class, had the first opportunity in American history to actually have a quality of life and meaning without debt. And they did. Now also, you talk about being great. How about this? America is the only nation that went in after it had defeated its enemies and rebuilt all their countries. We rebuilt not just Germany. We helped with Poland and Czechoslovakia and France and Italy and Japan, and that allowed them to become, well, Japan became the second most powerful economic power in the world. It's now third behind China. But think of what that meant, that we helped through the Marshall Plan, all these other people who have been our enemies. Historically, if you defeated someone, you took their resources, you enslaved their people, you destroyed their leaders. 
We didn't. That takes great minds doing great things, and I'm proud of that. Also, look at the folk music uh, as an artistic form of protest and motivation. Woody Guthrie, uh, Phil Oakes, Pete Seeger, Bob Dylan. And look at the blues singers, the Delta and the Chicago blues that continues to influence music today. And the course of jazz, John Coltrane and uh, all the others who contributed something unique. That's greatness. And technology in general, from Ben Franklin and Eli Whitney right up till today. If you go and get LASIK surgery, think of the marvel being able to correct your vision using that technology. Think of microsurgery in the brain to save a person's life. Think of, think of the reconnecting limbs. Think of restructuring faces that have been destroyed in accidents or mauled by a dog or whatever. We're able to do that. You see, I'll be critical of medicine in its deficiencies, chronic care. I will respect it in its capacity to help in emergencies. It's the best in the world. From all over the world, people come to the United States to get the best that we have. And it's the cutting edge. That is great. And also, imagine the, the Panama Canal, the Tennessee Valley Authority, the Trans-Oceanic Cable Communications, uh, think of the automobile, the telephone, uh, Nikola, uh, Nikola Tesla. Uh, think of the submarine, uh, the, the main force behind the Human Genome Project. Think of astrophysics and the f- founding of NASA and uh, most theories of cosmological science. And also the worst that we have become. Because here's what is not understood and here's where it can be conflated to the negative. I'm looking at the best that we have been, and I could spend a month nonstop talking about the people, the movements, the individuals, and what we've done at all levels. But also, I could spend the same amount of time on the things we've done wrong. And it's not because the American people has done something wrong. It's because those who've exploited their, their susceptibility, their trust, When we take someone's trust and we tell them, we know what's best for you and we give you a vaccine and the vaccine ends up causing injury to the child, that's a betrayal of trust. When we say that we know what your child should have for breakfast and now give them these kind of fruit loops or pops and the child ends up obese and with diabetes, that's betrayal of the trust. When we say, you know, take out this line of credit so you can buy yourself some furniture. Oh, and by the way, you're going to be paying 500% interest. That's a betrayal of trust. When we say we need to bring freedom and peace and prosperity and democracy to other countries, and we've never done that once when we've engaged in war since uh, World War II, from Vietnam, the legacy of Agent Orange still exists, to Afghanistan, to Iraq, to all the countries we unsettled in South America, creating narco states, to Libya and Syria and Ukraine. Yeah, we did that. Not we, the people, did that. But those who are not constructing and have never constructed anything positive. Go back and look at the Clintons. Show me one thing they did that was constructive and positive. Barack Obama. You're going to say, you know, Obamacare? No, Obamacare wasn't about a universal health care that he originally promised. That was written by the insurance industry. That was a betrayal of our trust. And then we were sold it. You always know that something's bad in the offering when there's a heavy emphasis upon how it's sold to us. So yeah, we've got uh, you know we've got cheeseburgers and machine guns and and marshmallows and Kool Aid and Jello and reality TV and court TV and malls and nuclear bombs and uh, the polio vaccine and pop tarts and miniature golf. We got a lot. We got Lady Gaga and Madonna. We got a lot of stupid people in positions of power. Credit cards, that's disastrous. Colas and rodeos and uh, cheerleading at professional sports and tailgating. A lot of things I don't believe are great. I know they're not, but those are my thoughts. That we are a country of beautiful people creating wonderful things to help humanity. And the whole world is better because of it just as we continue to do things that are stupid, nihilistic, selfish, profit-driven, based upon a 
a completely fetid and cancerous capitalistic system. Now let's go over and say hello to uh, Richard Gale standing by. Hi, Richard. Good afternoon, Gary. Richard, well, tell us about the, the yeah. a more complete and honest portrait of, uh, of uh, John McCain. Well, those are the words I wanted to use, is try to be able to paint a caricature of, of John McCain. And uh, I'm going to speak for myself, because I, I've looked at his policies, and uh, of course he always had an imperial complex. He's been the one of the, there's never been a war that John McCain didn't like. And I, there's three things that I kind of see or uh, I extract from his this caricature, this portrayal. One is through and through he was a military man, and he, he viewed the world through the eyes of, of the military. Uh, we know of him as a war hero. Second, um, psychologically, he was very much conditioned by wealth. One of the big criticisms of John McCain was that he seemed to be very insensitive to the plight of others, uh, other minorities. We might remember he was the one that stood up most vehemently against uh, the Congress passing the Martin Luther King Day as a national holiday, even though Reagan signed it. He was he was very much opposed to that. And yet there were these contradictions. For example, he would to be very sensitive to people in his own state. Uh, he was an opportunist because he would support it. The support, whatever it was, he was going to be politically expedient for winning his elections. So you would see in Arizona his support for the Native Americans and Latinos, uh, which they have a much larger uh, percentage of the population, his support for Native American land rights. But then on the other hand, at the federal level, he was very insensitive to... Uh, the lower classes and his policies. He was, uh, uh, was a flip-flopper, uh, a very consistent flip-flopper. And I think one of the best examples was that going back to 2000, we might remember he ran for the primaries in 2000 for the GOP. Uh, he was one of the only voices in the Republicans that actually acknowledged climate change. Uh, he was concerned about it and seemed to have some understanding of the science he at least accepted that climate change was um, associated with human uh, fossil fuels. But then when he, in 2008, it was a complete flip-flop. It was, it, it, of course, he was aligned at that time then with uh, Sarah Palin, the Tea Party, which are climate change deniers. And there was this complete switch. And then again, when he lost the election, he returned to be a senator of Arizona. Uh, again, he was pushing this... Um, the climate change. He and Lee, Joe Lieberman, who is one of his best buddies uh, from the Democrat Party, um, were for years trying to push the Climate Stewardship uh, Act, which was for uh, national policies to begin taking care of the environment, the earth. So uh, I think we could go in many different directions with this. I think one of the one of the things, we, as I mentioned, psychologically being conditioned by wealth, his his wife. Cindy is estimated at $200 million, so she's uh, an heiress of the Amhire Sir Bush uh, beer dynasty. He himself was worth approximately $16 million personally, to, uh, according to the Center for Responsible Politics. But w- more important is to look at, I think, this, uh, you know, his imperial complex. Uh, if the Department of War were to give a grade, he received an A. If he were to receive uh, a grade from the Department of Peace, it would certainly be an F. Uh, he was completely on board with the invasion of Afghanistan. Um, you know, he was also a close friend of, Sen- of, of Senator Lindsey Graham, another itinerant war hawk, uh, and he w- was served as uh, Phil, Bland- Phil Graham was uh, his economic advisor during his campaign. He supported the Contras. He was one of the most vocal voices uh, again, opposing the U.S. government cutting off aid to the Contras. He himself donated money to the Nicaraguan Contras. Contras. Of Syria, he always hated Bashar. Of Syria, uh, started calling for the arming of the Free Syrian Army, which at that time was all comprised of a network of Sunni fundamentalist groups. 
uh, uh, Libya, he supported NATO bombing. Uh, at first, before everything, he actually had a pretty good relationship in the view of, of Gaddafi. And then, it was, it was, again, this was a major flip-flop. He was always a champion of the war on terror in African nations, consistently calling for the U.S. military intervention in conflict zones, notably Mali. Uh, he wanted to deploy special forces to fight Boko Haram in, in Nigeria and Sudan, where both uh, McCain and his wife had invested uh, for heavily invested in, in Sudan industries for quite a while. Iran is an interesting one with him because we might remember his famous statement, bomb, 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 around from the Beach Boys song. But very early on, he was um, he was a supporter of the MEK, which is the, uh, the this which was designated by the State Department as a terrorist organization, is the People's Mujahideen of Iran, better known as MEK. And this is the same group today that the State Department and the Department of Defense would be propping up to kind of take over uh, take over the uh, Iran in the event of a, of a collapse of the regime. Uh, so he supported them for staging the guerrilla uh, terror war against the Islamic Republic. And uh, he even was the one responsible for bringing MEK terrorists for training uh, in Nevada. And that, that was something I never knew. I never knew his, his activities that he had. He's defended Netanyahu, his, his uh, attacks on Gaza in 2015. He was always was very wishy-washy uh, about the two-state solution, uh, but he always supported support of groups who opposed a Palestinian nation. So this is another one of these kind of gray areas with him. Uh, Bosnia, Kosovo, um, he backed all the violent radicals in the Balkans as well. Uh, he, he backed a, a group called the, um, the Tukfiri movements. So this is related to the Kosovo Liberation Army, which was a genocidal jihadist organization that was tied to al-Qaeda. Ukraine, there's the famous pictures of him, photos, ops, when he visited Ukraine. With Nazis, neo-Nazis. It was standing, a lot, standing alongside the Nazis, right, and especially the opposition le leader, Tiana Book, uh, who was the co-founder of the fascist uh, social R Nazi Richard, national party. Richard, if you could just give us a final summary, because we're running out of time. Well, I think uh, we the best summary I think we could really give is that uh, McCain is a product of of imperial overreach. Uh, okay, as was his father, who was an admiral, and his father, as which his is now father, and he he never left the Cold War. Okay, good. And, that's a good uh, summary. You know, I think that's. I think that would kind of summarize him. Good. Okay. And tomorrow, I'm going to play a clip from someone who remembers what he was really like. Uh, when he was a prisoner of war, and what he was like on a ship where over 100 people yeah. died in a fire from because McCain's recklessness in, in uh, landing a jet. There's a whole lot of the story that we still have to uh, look at, and we're going to do that tomorrow. Thank you very much, Richard. Okay. I appreciate okay. sharing that. Okay, Gary. Bye -bye. I'm Gary Knoll. Thank you all for watching. Look forward to sharing more tomorrow. Have a nice day.